can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Is a free and uncorrupted communication. was just such a fabulous morning. But now we're going to talk about theater. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I have to tell you, we, um, we did a production of QED at uh, MIT. Wonderful uh, Boston actor by the name of Jer uh, Jeremiah Kissel did it, and John Lipsky directed it. Uh, it's a terrific play, just a wonderful play. And there's a moment that comes later in the play from what David read so gorgeously. Um, which to me was so perfect to talk about the scientist. He, uh, he's on the phone with his doctor, and um, the doctor is giving him odds on the uh, operation, and they're not good. Um, and he, said, he has to make a decision about whether to go through with the operation or not. Finally, he decides to do it, and he says, um, just do one thing for me. He says, if I'm dying, wake me up. I want to know what it's like. <laughs> it's a wonderful moment. Um, <clears throat> I think the thing that was so amazing uh, about this morning, for me, knowing you don't know what I'm going to say, I do. So uh, I was hearing what was going on from my point of view. And um, <clears throat> you started talking about religion. We're going to talk about that uh, in my paper, but bear with me, okay, with that, because it's somewhat, I'm trying to work out a somewhat complicated, I think, uh, idea about that. And also, uh, I had an illumination because Marsha was talking about um, the feeling in the air that something is going on and is about to break. Um, and I think that's another reason we're having conferences like this now, where the arts and, and science are somehow coming together and trying to, um, th th that science is becoming a part of the arts. And it's, it'll happen in this paper, I think. Describe it. Um, uh, for the past two years or so, and I think Alan and I are going to talk about this a little later too, um, uh, we've been having these monthly informal wine and cheese get-togethers uh, at MIT between playwrights and scientists. It's been absolutely incredible. Uh, we discuss the points of contact between the processes of the scientist and the theater artist, the criteria for success in our different disciplines, questions of ethics, you know, all the stuff you know, that's been sort of in the air here. Um, we share stories, insights. It's, uh, I, I call it a convivial anti-CP snow gorilla group. Um, one of the moments in this session stands out for me uh, in relation to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Bob Jaffe, whom m many of you may know, a theoretical physicist, who had just joined the group, uh, said, uh, well, why are there so many plays about science nowadays? Uh, and I said, because theater's always been about religion. Um, and science is the religion of our time. Um, so I, Bob's face told me that that needed a little explaining. <laughs> so I'm going to do that now. I am not talking about any kind of organized religion that always demands faith in the contemporary world. I'm talking about those things that we believe in so irrefutably that we don't even have to think about them. Those things that are the basis from which all our other realistic decisions are made and the comfort we take from the, the idea that the world has some kind of coherence. 
Not meaning, not purpose, just coherence, okay? I'm talking about principles that describe our universe, organize our lives, and make sense of the world we inhabit. I'm talking about absolute belief. Now, in the medieval period, uh, the existence of God was not a question of faith. Um, it was a matter of fact, simply the way things were and everything followed from that. You didn't need faith when you knew from the evidence of your eyes that the earth was the center of God's universe. Hmm? Uh, you didn't question the ordering principle of God. God was the way things are. Now, there could be debates about the nature of God, about how God works, God's attributes, God's laws, but not about whether God was the ordering principle until Copernicus and Galileo and then Newton. If you think about it, uh, you can argue about the nature of science, how science works, science's attributes, science's laws, but not about science. Okay. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't until Copernicus and Galileo, and that, uh, well, it was slightly before him, certainly, that they started burning people up for thinking differently. Um, <clears throat> today, whether we have faith in God or not, it's science that tells us the way things are. All right, let's set aside uh, the, you know, all the political controversy about evolution and creationism. Uh, I'd suggest that whichever side someone is, is, is on, on in, that, in that struggle, if you were to ask them if they believe in science, they would say yes without question. And in fact, the argument the creationists use against evolution is a scientific argument. It's flawed, but it's in the language of science. So it's those un unquestioned assumptions about the way things are, the order of the universe that we take for granted, that gives existence collective shape and meaning, and that's what I call the religion of the time. And this is science in the 21st century. And theater has mirrored contemporary assumptions about the cosmos throughout its history. It's what theater does. See, everything this morning worked. It's what Shakespeare called holding up the mirror to nature, right? And that's what it does. Holds up the mirror to nature and, and, and defines it. In Greece, now we're going to roller skate through history. Okay. Um, in Greece, even after they had anthropomorphized the powers of nature and called them gods, the performance space itself incorporated the organization of the cosmos. I'm going to talk about structure here and architectural structure as much as, as dramatic structure. You have a raised platform that placed the principles between the chorus and the sky and they're flanked by statues of the gods. The hero's body is the battleground of the gods and the chorus witnesses the revelation of truth as the action plays out before them. And the audience with the Aegean Sea in view behind the Scena witnesses it as well. They're awestruck and they're celebrating the way things are. I'm stress, uh, st stressing the configuration of the playing space here because it was this that also determined the structure of the performance itself, how the story was told. You could trace the ways in which this idea that theater architecture itself embodies the cosmos of its time through history, the way the medieval theater originates in a church structure that mirrors the organization of the Christ Christian cosmos as every church does and how anachronisms abound in the narrative because all time is one in the mind of God. And you can have a multiplicity of playing spaces reflecting how all creation is one in the mind of God. And then the Elizabethan theater comes along with its painted zodiac over the, over the, the thrust stage and very real 
throne. Okay? And it reflects the ways in which God's will is now manifested in his kings and how the structure and content of the theater becomes wholly secularized and the king is the effective ordering principle of society. And then the theater moves indoors as the problematic tension between faith and reason, church and state, begins to escalate. And when Galileo and Newton's demonstration of a mathematically measured and proven organization of the universe takes hold as irrefutable, time in the drama becomes linear and perspective in scenery becomes the norm. I'm talking about Galileo and Newton not only because they revolutionized science but because they ultimately changed the very nature of the common sky under which we live in the West. From the 18th century on, the theater continues indoors. The basic shape of the audience, the auditorium, with its objective relationship between audience and performers, embodies the new objective principle of science. Dramatic action has linear structure. The playing space is circumscribed by a proscenium arch so that we can view it. And by the early 20th, structure, the, uh, 20th century, the structure and content of theater has become entirely secularized. The influence of Freud and Marx's worldview is reflected in psychological realism, expressionism, epic theater. Uh, for a while, Freud and Marx... Um, become powerful sects of the contemporary scientific religion, maybe, but neither gains the full power or endurance that pure scientific thought has. Science and the processes of reason and verifiable result have already become the foundations of communal belief transcending sectarianism. The well-made play reflects the well-made cosmos. And along comes Einstein, and Heisenberg, and quantum physics. And they redefine the nature of time and space. And what happens in the theater? Well, first, their ideas reshape the common cosmos. The shape of the theater fractures. New forms of storytelling become possible because we are seeing nature with new eyes. The curtain that delineated the realms of objective audience and examined performance disappears. The stage becomes round, square, three quarters, site specific. Time becomes circular, simultaneous, capable of moving forward and back. Space and light take on new and more variable characteristics. The very action of the drama becomes more ambiguous and in certain ways more precise. We're moving into the age of postmodernism, and it's a direct, clear uh, uh, child of uh, quantum uh, physics. The audience responds to these shifts because they know they embody the scientific truth of the way things are. And so the theater is still mirroring that. <coughs> and slow down, Alan. Okay, I want to look at some contemporary plays about science or scientists that embody the religion of the time and how some of them are having an effect on the structure of the drama in general. Um, okay, ever since really starting with Arcadia, uh, the kind of delight that ensued at the, as you know, Tom Stoppard showed off the way he did that he could structure a play on mathematics and chaos theory. Um, uh, science and mathematics appear fairly regularly on serious stages. It's happening more and more clearly. In most plays, some aspect of science or mathematics serves as a plot device. In others, it structures the piece. And in a few, the performance actually embodies some scientific principle. Um, the ca central character in David Auburn's play, Proof. How many of you know Proof? Oh, good. Okay, terrific. Uh, have you talked about it before? Because I came in like, oh, good. Um, the action of the play uh, traces a woman's attempt to break free of the fear that she's going to lose her mind as her father did uh, in his last few years. The woman and her dead father are both brilliant mathematicians. Okay. 
the father appears in uh, fantasy uh, sequences and flashback memories. The major event of the play is the revelation that she had found a proof that a father had been working on before he lost his abilities. And critics and audiences, you know, remarked on the originality of the play because it incorporated mathematics into its plot. And they saw it as a trend toward plays about science. Proof is not really about mathematics at all. It's a traditional psychological drama. Okay. Uh, the mathematical proof is an engine that drives the action only insofar as it serves um, to free the female character. The mathematical proof is finally no different structurally than Big Daddy's inheritance in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof or George and Martha's son in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And Cat on a Hot Tin Roof is not about inheritance law. <laughs> and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf sure as hell isn't about parenting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the closest we get to witnessing the mathematical process in, in proof is this beautifully crafted scene where the father believes he's found a brilliant new uh, proof and it turns out it's a manic delusion. I mean, it's just a spine-chilling scene, wonderful coup de uh, théâtre, and it's still not about mathematics. Um, <clears throat> but the success of the play suggested there's a new interest in the way that the subjects of mathematics and science were becoming a conscious part of the subject matter of plays that were already unconsciously structured on early 19th and 20th century uh, scientific principles. Um, Michael Frayn's Copenhagen, on the other hand, uses Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle as well as nuclear physics to inform the very structure of the drama. And this moves closer to a new form. It's not there yet, but it moves closer, where the subject and the structure begin to inform each other. Um, you know the play. I'm not going uh, to... We've been talking about it a lot, but the three characters... Heisenberg, Bohr, and Bohr's wife, Margaret, are in an undetermined space and time. Each remembers the events of the visit differently. Each assigns it his or her own significance. By the end of the play, we've witnessed the entire meeting in Copenhagen from three different perspectives, but the truth of any one of them is left unresolved. And the dramatization Here's the real thing. The, dramatiz structurally, the, re the dramatization of the single elusive event which is already in the past of the characters and being examined from the dramatic present of the action embodies the principle of uncertainty. So it's actually informing the structure itself that way. So the principle is not only one of the themes in the play, it's the source of its dramatic structure. Um, And that's very different, obviously, from proof. In 2001, the Piccolo Teatro in Milan offered an entire play, a season of plays, dealing with science. Incredible. Uh, they included, unfortunately, they were all in Italian. Um, <laughs> they included Copenhagen, Brecht's Galileo, which we haven't talked about much here, uh, a new play about Giordano Bruno, and one extraordinary theatrical event called Infinities. It's not to be confused with my play, Small Infinities. Um, Infinities represents perhaps the most sophisticated and revelatory incorporation of science into a theatrical event today. Uh, and I believe it may point to a whole new direction in the relationship between science and theater. It just blew me away. Uh, Franco Ronconi directed it. Uh, he's the artistic director of the Piccolo. Um, he was planning the season of plays about science and he approached John Barrow from Cambridge. Uh, many of you may know John, uh, know Barrow. Um, and uh, he asked him to write something for the season. And Barrow said uh, he wasn't a playwright. And Ron Coney explained that that's why he asked him. Uh, he didn't want to play. He wanted a scientific paper. Uh, and he asked Barrow to write a paper about some aspect of infinity. 
and said he would theatricalize the text. Okay? That's exactly what happened. Uh, he wrote a paper on five paradoxes of infinity. Um, Ronconi rented an empty warehouse uh, for the piccolo and proceeded to divide it into five playing areas. He found ways to embody each of the five paradoxes through the manipulation of the performer's bodies in carefully designed spaces. The physical actions within each space lasted from about 15 to 20 minutes and then repeated in a kind of loop. Uh, the audience was free to move from one space to another in any pattern they wanted, including constantly returning to one or another of them. Okay. The only language came from the barrow paper, whether in the mouths of the performers or in a voice over the action, and it was breathtaking. And what started to happen, you see, was that you really began to feel, to, to, not just to witness the, uh, these paradoxes of infinity, but to begin to feel yourself physically engaged with them in some way. Uh, it was the sensation of Milan that year. But it's not strictly a play, okay? It's, it's a theatrical event. Uh, none of the familiar dramatic material of conflict between characters. No Aristotelian beginning, middle, and end. Uh, and in speaking about it after it had opened, Ron Coney was very explicit about this. He said he appreciated the narrative structures of the Brecht play um, and Copenhagen and uh, even the somewhat sprawling G Giordano Bruno play. But he was searching for a new theatrical form that would accommodate the new world view and the subject of science. He didn't want infinities to be about science. He wanted it to be embodied science. It was the most radical meeting of science and theater I've seen to date. And like most radical ventures, it threw new light on the more centrist work. Um, the most marked aspect of infinities is its absolute lack of narrative. It freed it from any trace of linearity and points to ways the theater may someday tackle string theory or imaginings of new dimensions. Yeah. Um, Proof and Copenhagen are good plays in their own rights, but a work like Infinity helps make us aware of how they depend on earlier conventions, structures that rest on a vision really of the Newtonian cosmos. They trace their lineage in plays about science to Ibsen's An Enemy of the People, which uses a scientific issue to explore political and social conflict. Uh, Shaw's Back to Methuselah, which really tried to dramatize and extend Darwin. Uh, Brecht's Galileo, which explores the ethical responsibilities of the science, scientist through biographical epic. All use narrative and character as their armatures. Infinity's lineage lies in Samuel Beckett, who was really the inheritor of, of the quantum world. Uh, in the cyclic movement of Waiting for Godot, with its apparent non-events, apparent non-events. In Crap's Last Tape, with its revelation of the past and the present. And in Endgame, with its vision of entropy and infinite time that is made palpable for the audience in the final elongated and agonizing moments. Any of you have ever seen a good production of Endgame? Um, you have that experience of just falling into uh, the, uh, the vision of that play. Uh, in Beckett's work, we experience the world as it is described by the new science, even though there's no direct allusion to science at all. Uh, as a mid-20th century theatrical event, it was prophetic for some, was baffling for a lot of people, but it was one of the first major articulations of what it was like to be alive in the mid-20th century in a world of science. And after E equals MC squared became part of the vo common vocabulary. In fact, Hallie Flanagan, um, who started a living newspaper in the 1930s, did one last play of the living newspaper in the early 1950s, and guess what it was called? E equals MC squared. E equals MC squared. Um, 
I want to talk about one other uh, play, uh, a theater event, and that's Robert Lepage's Far Side of the Moon, um, which he's now been touring. It's a one-man show, uh, one man and 500 stagehands. <laughs> Um, but it's halfway, in certain ways, it's halfway between Copenhagen and Infinities in, in its structure. Um, Lepage uh, is known, uh, he's, he's an artist, a theater artist that works out of Montreal. He's been really quite extraordinary. Uh, he's known for his multimedia productions, some of them lasting up to six or seven hours. Uh, talk about Infinity. Um, uh, he does take characters through some kind of journey, uh, and the narrative is interspersed with startling poetic stage imagery, film, and technological spectacle. And it's anything but linear. And the weight between the story and sustained physically engaging Im imagery is always in this delicate balance. And it, kind of, it, it seems to me that, that his, his work absolutely mirrors the place we're at now in terms of the shift in the common mind, in, in the, the theater audience's mind, um, in, in the nature of the, the scientific cosmos that, we, the, the, the cosmos that we live in, as we understand it from, from science. Um, it, it's, it, it ostensibly tells the story of two estranged brothers, uh, and they're both played by a single actor in the production. Uh, who, and his relationship, the, the relationship is strained by the recent death of their mother. The real focus, though, is on one of the brothers, Philippe, an unsuccessful historian of science. He keeps being late for conferences. Um, who traces his own development through the history of, of all things, the Russian space program. Uh, and, and he's becoming more and more fascinated with the world beyond the moon, um, beyond our own cosmos. In, in the play. And early in the play, it lasts about two hours and ten minutes, no intermission. Uh, but they tell you that beforehand, <laughs> so you can... Um, and the audience is introduced to the temporally and spatially fractured uh, shape of the journey. The major character is emptying his laundry from a washing machine. Uh, and he's finished, he puts his head through the door and then his shoulders. And his whole body disappears through the washing machine door as we see a video of him uh, from the other side seeming to enter space. Uh, that image transforms into a Russian astronaut, weightless, leaving his ship to begin a spacewalk. Okay. And the, the, the bleeding of one of those images into the other is simply breathtaking. The ideas of space and space travel, the possibilities of extragalactic life, as well as historical footage of the Russian space program, run through all of the imagery of Far Side of the Moon. It's the final image of the play. When the dual threads of traditional narrative and the postmodern images come together, absolutely breathtaking stage conceit. Philippe is sitting in one line of chairs arranged horizontally on the stage. And behind and slightly above him, tilted, is a mirror that runs along the, the, uh, the length of the stage. Okay? And the floor is black. And he drops off the chair and begins to move around on the floor, on his stomach, on his back. Uh, he occasionally grasps a chair, uh, but he's moving freely over this black floor. And in the mirror, as we watch him, he is floating weightless. And it, um, it's sustained for a good five minutes, which is very long for stage time. And the audience finds itself experiencing weightlessness. Now, even while we're aware of how the illusion is being made, and that's what's so marvelous about it. We can go back and forth, you see, and see, watch him writhing around on the floor, and then all we have to do is look up, and we're there, you know, and, we're, and we're weightless. Um, 
in, like infinities, he creates moments that are not about their subject, but embody the subject. At the same time, he does develop individual characters whose lives are directly influenced by the scientific world they, they inhabit. You know, those are just a, a few of the ways in which science, as the organizing principle of knowledge in the world, is gaining density in the fabric of contemporary theater. Uh, it's informing the theater artist's vision of the nature Hamlet wants to mirror. Um, the plays that are the products of the Newtonian worldview will, of course, continue to have something to say to us when they touch on universal human experience, just as those of the Greeks and the medieval mystery plays and Shakespeare do. But as contemporary science redefines the cosmos, that new definition will gradually become absorbed into the consciousness and belief system of the populace. And when it becomes an undisputed truth, the theater will reflect it, not just as subject, but in the very structure of its dramas and their production. Thank you. I asked Bill if, we could, if, if Alan Brody and I could have a little time together uh, to perhaps uh, tell you a little bit about or reenact uh, an unusual gathering that we've had for the last couple of years that Alan mentioned. Uh, we've uh, had a gathering about every six weeks or so of, of uh, five or six playwrights and five or six scientists at MIT. Um, this is from 5 to 7 p.m. Um, well-defined boundaries, and we have uh, wine and cheese. Um, you probably know uh, some of the physicists who have been coming. Um, Jerry Friedman, Alan Guth, Bob Jaffe have been members of the group, and we've had um, some uh, biologists as well. Um, and I think that it's, it's worked very well because we've never had an agenda. Um, no one's ever had to do any homework. We had wine, so we didn't need an agenda. <laughs> um, we discussed a wide variety of issues, and Alan mentioned uh, a few of them. But um, I think that, that uh, unlike um, some of what we've been talking about here at this uh, conference here, the, uh, the, the final product of of having uh, science or scientific ideas or scientific structure in theater, the product of this gathering has been the gathering itself. And the way that these two groups of people have uh, affected each other and the ideas that they've exchanged. So the, the whole concept, uh, a raison d'etre of the group, was the belief that, that uh, scientists and theater people uh, had something to say to each other and something to learn from each other. So that is the product. Yeah. Um, well, it's, uh, what you discover, though, that, that, that's so surprising is that we share so much uh, in the passion with which we work, in, uh, in really what we're after in terms of understanding something deeply. Uh, but the big problem in the beginning was understanding each other's language. It was really a question of bilingualism. You know? um, and uh, when I talked about passion, for instance, and when Bob Jaffe talked about passion, or Wolfgang Ketterle talked about passion, entirely different, uh, they meant seemed to mean entirely different things until we, we got to the, to the nub of the matter. That was, that's been fascinating. Um, the, uh, one of the most important things for me is that, and this was very surprising, uh, was what the scientists thought we do as playwrights, and how surprised they were when we dis the, the, when they discovered that's not what we do. You know, that we don't, you know, first of all, write with a fine frenzy and our eyes rolling. Okay, um, that uh, that we're not only interested, in fact, in the emotional moments, 
but the ideas. We have one, one playwright, some of you may know John Lipsky, who keeps saying, okay, how can a scientific idea become a character? Okay. How can the idea itself, how can, let's say, a character have such passion about his or her ideas that that's the driving action of the, uh, of the play? Um, I told him to read Bernard Shaw, but he doesn't listen to me. Um, but, you know, how do you, how do you do it with science, with that same kind of passion with science. And he's still struggling with this. And it's wonderful to watch him struggling with it. And, uh, and, and to have these theoretical physicists sort of trying to help him along, you know, with it, and explain to him how it works. But that's a question that's constantly coming up. And it's, it's really the heart of what I was talking about before, which is how, how does this new uh, openness to science really begin to force us to rethink what a drama can be. One of the things that was interesting to me, and I would like to have, have the, you guys ask those questions, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but what do the scientists have to gain from this group? Yes. Uh, because the, the, the playwrights, I mean, it's clear that there's now uh, sort of a, a industry <laughs> small industry of, of making plays about science and the playwrights uh, uh, are interested in, in getting uh, ideas from scientists uh, not only so about you, could, you could get shared royalties that's right <laughs> right but what do the scientists have to get out of this and particularly these five or six scientists who keep showing up every six weeks what are we getting out of yeah. this and this is my opinion, but I think that one of the things that we get, get out of this is we find out from the playwrights what in our own lives make good stories. And sometimes we scientists don't know ourselves yeah. Yeah. what are the good stories. That's absolutely right. I mean, you, you will very, not you particularly, but somebody will say, well, here's a good story, you know, and they will tell some sort of built-in narrative from the past, his history mm -hmm. about, you, why don't you write about that? That's terrific. Um, and there was this one wonderful moment when uh, um, Deborah Wise, who's a playwright uh, in Boston, asked Alan Guth to tell about what happened when he figured out, you know, when that moment of, of understanding of the inflated uh, universe, uh, he understood exactly how to express it and, and how, how to do it. And Alan said, well, you're not very interested in that. And, and he, but he said, well, I, you know, I was. And then he started to tell how, uh, it, how he had been working on it and trying to figure it out. And as he started to talk, and as he started to move back in his own time to when this was happening, the entire room had a silence about it that was so deep as we were there with him. And he finally talked about simply the, the intuitive moment <coughs> when it happened. And it was like, I mean, it was an event, that was an event in a play. Mm -hmm. How do you dramatize it? I'm not so sure yet, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, but he had no idea of how powerful that story was. But we've told other stories that have gone over like lead balloons. That, that I mean, well, that, you can't win them all. That's right. Alan. <laughs> but, but this is what we learn. Yeah. See, right. I mean, we tell stories not only yeah. about our own careers, mm -hmm. but we tell things from history of, of mm -hmm. uh, like when Henrietta Leavitt discovered a method for measuring distance to stars, or when Lee Meitner found out, uh, figured out how. Uh, nuclear fission worked or yeah. the physics yeah. behind it. And so we tell, we tell other stories and some of them register with the playwrights yeah. and some of them don't. Yeah. And it, it's something I think that the, that the scientists learn, uh, that is we don't all, uh, unless we're writing uh, autobiographies, we don't always think of our lives in terms of of stories. I mean, they're there, yeah. of course, but we, we, we don't give, give our lives epic proportions or whatever else, yeah. the tragedy and the thrill that goes into stories. And by hearing from the playwrights yeah. what turns you on and what doesn't, 
it's a way of us helping to organize our own lives and to think about yeah. them. I mean, we don't all have heroic lives, but, but it, it, it tells us what makes a, a story to a playwright, what has uh, an emotional consistency or a dissonance or whatever it is that playwrights are seeking to, you know, in your mirror to life. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, you can see it when um, uh, you, th you throw something out and, and it does but then there are those other moments when, when you see five of us, you know, just suddenly sit up and you can hear the, you know, the computer keys clicking in our heads. Uh, you did it once, twice, three times with us. Uh, and they weren't about you, actually, but they were about what was fascinating you. One had to do with Teller uh, and the idea of the richness of the possibility of Teller as a character, actually. Um, and why don't you tell about the business of the, of the German physicists, the intern German physicists in England? I mean, that just blew us away. Well, this is something that probably a number of people know, but, uh, but, but after, uh, during, at the end of World War II, uh, when uh, Germany had been defeated, the number of German physicists were rounded up by the Allies and taken to a building uh, outside of Cambridge called Farm Hill. Farm Hall, yes, Farm Hall. And this was uh, uh, written about and documented um, in a book by Jeremy Bernstein called The Uranium Club. Have, how many people have, have seen that book? Good. Well, anyway, unbeknownst to the German scientists, and they included Heisenberg and Von Weizsäcker and uh, I think maybe Max Perutz was there. Um, these were all the Germans who might, he wasn't there, okay. These were all the, the Germans who might have had uh, knowledge of, of the German atomic bomb project. Uh, they were s secretly tape recorded. And uh, many of those tapes have been translated and published in this, this book, uh, The Uranium Club. And it, it, it offers amazing insights into what these men were thinking. Um, during the time that they were interred, um, the U.S. dropped the atom bomb uh, on Japan. And the news was brought to the German scientists while they were there. Uh, they, were, they were informed of this. And their reactions are recorded. And they're just uh, stunning. Uh, at first, the reactions were disbelief. And then they go through a huge range of reactions. Um, uh, Otto Hahn was, was one of the Germans who was interred there. And, and Hahn uh, uh, was one of the first people to actually uh, discover experimentally that the uranium nucleus could be fissioned, so he actually discovered fission experimentally and uh, always had taken credit for it. And uh, he uh, was devastated with this news that he felt that he personally resp was responsible for the killing of all of these people. But you get their raw reactions in these transcripts of the conversations, um, basically unedited. And uh, I think that would be a magnificent uh, possibility for a play to reenact yeah. these, these people at Farm Hall. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's a, the it, premise is just spectacular. And you've got excellent primary source material. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that was one of the stories that I told. And, uh, that, yeah, and it, that it did electrify us. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question over there? Well, I'll throw out an idea for anyone who wants to grab it based on that. The fact that the Americans, many of the American scientists would not shake hands with Heisenberg after the fact, even though they built the bomb and they dropped it, huh. Heisenberg was ostracized. The paradox of sort of American chutzpah and hubris there mm. would be a great play. Yeah. Should, we should we take questions? Sure. sure. David Cassidy, who's the uh, historian of both Einstein and Heisenberg and recently Oppenheimer, yeah. told me he wrote a play just on the basis of that, and he's about to send it to me. So, so people have done that. The tragedy of the uh, Farmhall tapes is that they were, of course, in German, 
transcribed into English, and then the German, the original German lost. So you really don't have the original words. You have a poor translation of it. But David Cassidy has written something, and I don't know what it is. Well, here we are back to the uncertainty principle. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to go back <coughs> to the uh, asking about, which is why, uh, just m much more generally than stories about Heisenberg, which we could tell, <laughs> uh, about the affinity between the sciences, more generally than just physics, and, and the arts. And I was wondering whether, to some extent, that's because both um, have suffered so much in the last 200 years. And let me explain what I mean by that. <laughs> so you, as you described, theater used to be central. I mean, way back era of the Greeks or even Elizabethan theater, theater was pretty important. And uh, you guys are really suffering now. Yeah, well. Now you might, say, you might wonder why I would say that science is suffering. But if you also go back 200 years, the enlightenment, science was going to provide all the answers. Uh, you know, the scientific revolution, after the scientific revolution, science had lots of promise. It's going to solve all the problems, not just the problems of the natural world, but all the problems. And there, that didn't work exactly so well. Created problems, and, and so there was a counter-reaction. And scientists retreated. And you've retreated. You no longer you know, play the role you did in ancient Greece, most of the arts, um, or even you know, 200 years ago. So both extremes, in a sense, have retreated from their position of glory in society. Science remains important, and, but it's theater. retreated in its goals and in its own arena, has perhaps done miracles, but it has retreated from trying to solve all the problems of the world and address all the issues of the world or of humanity and the arts feel beleaguered and as well and and I'm wondering whether that's one reason for so the middle ground with all the power has been occupied by others politicians sociologists religious leaders uh, heads of corporations money makers and if we look around for our allies seekers of truth you know who've had to retreat in the application of that truth for us, in many ways, the natural place are the artists. I mean, they're mm. pure thinkers, pure searchers of truth, uh, as we are. As you are, yeah. Both have retreated from trying to be, you know, as enlightenment, agents of the enlightenment or uh, agents of the muse to explaining everything or dealing with everything. Well, there may, there may always but, be a, uh, uh, um, the danger of hubris in, in anything, even, you know, even the, the well, I was talking about the danger of lack of hubris. <laughs> In other words, both of us have suffered. Well, it may come. It may be from hubris. Of though. lack yeah. of hubris. Yeah, but the Enlightenment may have may have you know to to resolve us of all ambiguity. Yeah, but as so we've been said. suffering. So I, I side with Wilson uh, that scientists have retreated too far. Uh. Now maybe the arts too have been beaten back too far, and... Uh... Yeah. I think there's also a more prosaic explanation for the affinity between the scientists, uh, actually the mutual admiration and love, and the humanities. And that is, you hinted at that, is that the rest of the world is our common enemy, really. The, the money makers and the politicians, and particularly the social scientists. Because the, so, because the social scientists claim to be scientists, but are not. They are politically driven. They don't admit it, but they're politically driven. The humanists don't claim to be scientists, uh, and so they have respect for it. And, they, and, and, and I mean, I once got into terrible trouble when I was provost of my university, when I talked about the various uh, uh, departments and fields. And I said, of course, I extraordinary belief and uh, admiration for the sciences. I'm a scientist myself. But if I want to learn something about human behavior and human knowledge and the evolution of human nature, uh, 
I'd rather read a good novel or see a good play than read a paper by political scientists about it, or a psychologist for that matter. And I think that partially explains our mutual admiration. I, you know, I remember uh, Harold Clerman uh, uh, was with him in Aspen once, and he was, he was speaking, and um, in the question and answer period afterward, uh, somebody said to him, where do you see the theater going in the next 10 years? And he said, I don't know if any of you knew how, they always talk like this. He said, uh, you want to know where the theater's going in 10 years? I'll tell you where the theater's going in 10 years. It's going to be in trouble. It's been in trouble for 2,000 years. It's going to be in trouble for the next 10 years. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's uh, been dis mentioned yet, but I'm reminded in this context of Whitehead's um, description of, uh, of our suggestion of the relation between science and uh, Greek drama when he just tells the setting at the Royal Society when the results of the Eddington exp expedition were announced and the, the dramatic setting. I think he goes on and it's in Science in the Modern World. I, I think he goes on in, in, in that uh, description to suggest that perhaps that uh, the uh, very origins of um, physics, I think he says, lies in Greek tragedy and in the, in the dimensions of, of, of Greek tragedy. I wonder if that's um, discussed. Uh, if you well, well, comment the, on that. I mean, the first text we have is Prometheus. And he's a physicist. <laughs> no, and that's why... <laughs> That's why Zeus gets so mad at him. You know, he he gi he gives he gives humankind uh, a little too much knowledge. Yeah. I just want to ask a question about how this has worked. Uh, other than you yourself, Alan, 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 am I right? Thank you, Alan, am I right? Have any of the scientists who have come been inspired to try a new kind of writing by this experience? I, I mean, you've been doing it already. Have any others? Follow, begun to follow that path? Well, uh, I'm not sure about that, but I know that, uh, that Bob Jaffe has, has written his first popular article. That's good. He's in, yeah. in the process he's of, of now. finishing it now, yeah. Actually, an interesting thing happened, because when I was vetting this paper, I, I, I was having lunch with Alan Guth, and um, because I was scared to death of all of you. And, um, and he said, you know, this paper, I, as I was reading your paper, I thought, gee, maybe we ought to change the style of scientific papers, of the writing of scientific papers. Maybe there's something, you know, he was struck by the idea that, that, uh, that structure changes. Uh, with the with reality, so that if the subject is is changing and the very nature of the science is changing, maybe uh, he ought to start looking for a new way to express that, even in the structure of the papers. This I was be, really very this taken. This could be by very far-reaching. Yes. Yeah, I was very taken yeah. by that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that that we're now able to. Right. Yeah. Well, I would. I'd like to get back to the history you recounted, which might be seen as a history of power and the way that power is used, has been used to control belief. Yeah. And, so, uh, and, and God might be seen in that light yeah. as well. And certainly there is a moment when science in the Enlightenment uh, takes, exactly. seems to take that centrality. Uh, and I, I think that a, a good question, since the Enlightenment uh, seemed to give a privileged position to science as something that is, that is a freeing mechanism, mm -hmm. that is about freedom. Uh, I, I think uh, there is a, still a profound question whether uh, that uh, science as a, a central expression of the worldview um, might still be seen as a, as a mechanism of, uh, of the control of belief, a mechanism of power. And I wonder if your, uh, if your inquiry face-to-face -face might uh, be a way of sort of redirecting attention at that exact issue. I think that's absolutely right. I think, and you know, you know what else? It, it, what happens is that the subject itself only 
becomes a part of the fabric of this, not the structuring of it, but the, the subject itself only becomes a part of this when something is in the wind of change. You know, and the theater is sort of prophetic about it. That's what excited me about what Marcia was saying uh, in the earlier um, panel when she said, you know, there's a sense that there's going to be a whole new remodeling, a whole new way of thinking about these things, and you can feel it sort of in the air. And I think the th that's what the theater is picking up on in terms of suddenly having science the subject of it, just as, you know, uh, the kings became the subject of, of the Elizabethan theater before they chopped his head off. Right. Alan, uh, Alan, uh, Alan Brody, I wanted to uh, comment, perhaps question, uh, an assertion you made at the beginning of your talk when you went rapidly through the history where religion yeah. once was, the, was the dominant uh, belief of everybody, the basis of everything. And I certainly agree with you that science is a religion too, yeah. uh, which, which, which we deeply believe in. But uh, I think there the, are the parallel stops because first of all, religion was really believed in and understood by everybody. You didn't have to be an elitist uh, to, 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 to talk about religion. Uh, I mean, there were, but it was, it was, it was ingrained in people. Uh, then, in f then another arc about the Greeks, actually. I mean, the Greeks uh, were the ones who first invented science, actually, yeah. in spite of the fact yeah. that maybe because their religion wasn't monotheistic, and monotheism is a big... Uh, Tragedy, yeah. I think, for the illusion. But let me. But, oh, I want to, one more but, remark, uh, if I don't uh, forget it. Uh, yeah, most people today don't have science as a religion. It's wrong to say that science is the religion. It really is only a religion of the elite. And, well, no, and, I mean, and in the sense of, of, of the humanists, of the dramatists. Most people have no idea and do not really believe in science. They never understood, they never yeah. understood classical science, yeah. and let me, much less contemporary. Let, let, me, let me challenge you on that in, in this way. I think when you talk about science, yeah. and when, uh, uh, you're talking about your science because you're the high priest. And you, you know, in the medieval period, uh, they didn't speak Latin. The peasants didn't speak Latin. Uh, they depended on their priests for that. But that didn't stop them, stop the, uh, Christianity from being their religion. And, you know, and there were hierarchies, and I think you're quite right. You can, you can translate this into power if you want to. Uh, but nevertheless, it finally, that power in one way or another uh, um, conditions the way we see reality. You know? uh, but I think that, that, in fact, if you look at the hierarchy of science, now, um, without its being, uh, um, without the church, without the, the church hierarchy, there's still a hierarchy in, uh, we don't burn, we don't burn heretics at stake anymore. We just don't give them tenure. <laughs> oh, well, I, I think we do. I think the scientist does. Uh, on, no, this, uh, 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 on this, on uh, this issue. Oh, are we ending again? Yeah, we have to. We just got the word. Yeah. <laughs>